So thank you so much for joining us for today's webinar. This is, of course, the first in your eight-part series to complement your in-person training for the Seattle Heritage Responders Program. These webinars are made possible through the generous grant funding support of the National Endowment for the Humanities. We are kicking off this webinar series with three programs that take a broader approach to the topic of disaster response. I'm going to go ahead and pull over the overview of the schedule here just as a refresher for you all. So today's program, of course, is on the funding of cultural institutions affected by disasters. A session on July 18th will uh, cover the psychology of disaster situations, and then a session on July 25th will look at health and safety considerations for effectively working in these scenarios. From there, we'll move on to programs that address material-specific salvage considerations. So you all had a bit of this during our in-person session earlier, or actually last month now, back in May. Um, so we'll look at paintings, textiles, photos on electronic media, book of paper, and wooden and upholstered furniture. So all of these sessions are taught by members of the National Heritage Responders team who are conservators who have specialties in those areas. We'll wrap the final program on October 10th, which is a little less than a month before the final in-person meeting and disaster scenario. If you miss any webinar series, I will email you with a recording of the program. Just write to me when you finish with that recording and I'll note your attendance. You will be expected to complete all webinars before we meet again on November 1st. Before we begin today's presentation, I wanted to share some technical notes. On your screen, you'll see several boxes, including one labeled chat on the left-hand side. So you can, of course, use that chat box to say hello, to ask questions, or to share any information or links that you'd like. If you post a question in the chat box, you'll receive a response from me. All questions will be noted, collected, and then I will verbally ask them of our presenter when she completes her remarks. You will also note a box at the bottom of your screen titled Web Links. So how this works, click on one of the links to highlight it in blue, and then click that Browse To button at the bottom of your screen. That will go ahead and open the link in your preferred browser of choice. And with that, I'm very pleased to introduce you all to our presenter, Susan Matheson. Susan has worked in museums for 35 years as a conservator, administrator, and fundraiser. She has held conservation positions at the Morgan Library, the Smithsonian Institution, the National Gallery of Art, and the Cathedral of St. John the Divine. She was also the administrative conservator of the Conservation Center, New York University, where, in addition to being the department's development officer, she served on the adjunct faculty as a textile conservation consultant at Villa Le Pietra in Florence, Italy. Development positions include those at the National Academy Museum, the American Academy in Rome, and the Friends of the American Museum in Britain. In 2007, she started SAM Fundraising Solutions, a firm specializing in fundraising for historic preservation and art conservation. She helps museums, historic houses, and grassroots groups meet their fundraising and strategic planning goals, and presents workshops on a variety of fundraising topics. She also works with European organizations seeking to develop American patrons programs. Susan has published and presented extensively on topics ranging from textile conservation, collaboration, and fundraising. She has a Master of Arts in Museum Studies and Textile Conservation from the Fashion Institute of Technology and a Certificate in Fundraising from New York University. She has served on a variety of boards and committees, including the Collection Committee of King Manor Museum, Historic House in Jamaica, Queens, and on the board of the Historic Districts Council, New York City's only advocacy group for historic neighborhoods. And with that, I'm pleased to turn things over to Susan for her presentation on fundraising for disaster scenarios. Great. Well, thank you, Jeff. And welcome, everybody. Glad to see you here. And I'm excited to be the first one. I'm usually the last one in this series. So this is, this is a different take. Um, anyway, so let's get started. And Jeff, I'm not seeing my slides. Ah, there we are. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay. So you've had a disaster. And while you're all dealing with that damaged structure or your waterlogged collections, you also need to think about how you're going to pay for it all. And initially, there are a lot of funders you can go to right at that time of the emergency. And besides, you know, the obvious, like your insurance company, there are local disaster recovery options, such as those through state and local governments. Um, and here, you know, the Washington State Department of Commerce, the Emergency Management Grants, and I see there's someone from there in the um, audience. 
Um, and basically, these are not grants that you can apply for, but that your your city or county can apply for, and then get get filter the money through to you from that. Um, of course, there's the National Heritage Responders of AIC, as we all know. There's also the National Trust for Historic Preservation um, that has grants for a site that's been damaged in the last few days or weeks and by damaged by an unexpected event, such as a fire, flood, or high winds. And these are smallish grant, grants, 1,000 to 5,000, and basically are there to bring um, consultants in to help you assess the damage and figure out you know, what needs to be done and what it's all going to cost. Of note, too, for the first time this year, some of their other funds, like the Favreau and the Mitchell, are supporting bricks and mortar work. So if you've got building damage, they're a good place to go. And those grants range from about ten to 15000 And then, of course, there's FEMA. And rather than spending time going through the maze that is the FEMA process, I actually got in touch with a cousin of mine who did, who, who processed the applications after um, Hurricane Sandy here on Long Island. And, you know, I wanted to get some of his tips for dealing with FEMA. And basically, he said that completing the application is the easiest part. It's really the burden of proof that's much more difficult to produce after a disaster event. Um, so he said, make sure, you know, your documents and everything are backed up, they're off-site on, or in a cloud or someplace where you can get to them easily. You know, if you're dealing with a disaster, things are destroyed, they're waterlogged, whatever, and, you know, if you're able to access them on, in a cloud or something, they're much better to get at, too. Um, make sure your ta taxes and financial documents are accurate and up to date. No government agency, including FEMA, is going to want to talk to you if you owe them money or you've neglected your obligation to them. And you may say, well, of course our 990s are all filed and everything. Be careful and double check because I actually had a client who, you know, it was a case of one person thought the other person who thought the other person was submitting the 990. None of them did and they lost their tax exempt status. So um, it's just safer to double check. You know, also look at your financial statements, your audit. You know, make sure things aren't understated. You want an accurate schedule. Same thing with your schedule of art or documents or what have you. You know, make sure they're supported by recent um, appraisal. And, you know, have a make conversation before that disaster with your insurance broker to make sure that, you know, you might need different schedules within your, your policy for specific items. Um, know your geography and know that the risks that come with it, you know, so you can plan contingencies around those risks. And that's a theme I'll go back to quite a lot. And more important to um, at all, you know, when you're doing a grant claim, particularly if you're dealing with FEMA, just give them exactly what they ask for. Don't think you're going to be smarter by giving them more. It's not the way bureaucrats think. Give them what they ask for, and if they need more, they will ask for it. Now, what I've just outlined is responsive fundraising. There's a problem, you've had an emergency, a disaster, and you're seeking funds in reaction to that problem. But once you're past that initial recovery, you need to start thinking about how you're going to raise funds beyond your FEMA and government money and all of that. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, and I'm not giving a list of funders. This is about how to use the funders you have and how to find new ones. And frankly, because somebody will ask, they always do, there is no list of funders. I get asked about it all the time. It really doesn't exist. So what I want you to do is think about fundraising strategically, you know, creating that plan and thinking strategically about whom you're going to approach and how you're going to ask for and for what. Um, you know, how are you going to approach your disaster? Can you be more creative about um, presenting the problems um, the disaster has caused? And thinking too, you know, you're all planning, you're doing your disaster readiness, disaster preparedness plans, include fundraising in that as well. You know, are you going to do an immediate crowdfunding campaign? Are you going to do appeals? How are you going to communicate the disaster and its impact on collections? It's doing this is, is makes it a little less painful when it happens. 
Um, and because you know, you sort of know what disasters you're amenable to. I mean, in your area, it's fires. Here, it's hurricanes. I'm in New York, it's hurricanes. So you can sort of tailor your disaster fundraising plan to that and then tweak it if, let's say, you're hit by a major storm or windstorm or something like that. Now, one of the things I always hear as a conservator, and I still consider myself a conservator, not just non-practicing, as I call it, um, is that many feel this isn't relevant to their job. And my response to that is, oh, it is so relevant to your job. Because who is the best to communicate to your development department, director, board, the impact of collections and in conservation, collections care and conservation? That's what falls onto your soldier. And so what we're going to do here is, besides giving you background and real life examples, is help give you the language you need to communicate the need for fundraising for collections care in your institution. It's going to help you talk to the development department in their language and help you re understand what information they need, justification, impact. Um, and that in turn will help you get the resources you need to maintain your collection. And I've often heard, you know, oh, our needs are too small. Just remember, collections at the core of your institution, you know, without their care, there's no mission fulfillment. So if you think of it that way, suddenly your needs are not so small. Okay, so how are we going to do this? Um, really quickly, I'm going to do a brief fundraising 101. And along the way, give you a few pointers to help you think beyond usual suspects and, and how you approach looking at your donors. Um, there'll be helpful hints along the way, which is basically tips and tools. Research tools, you know, how do you do prospect research if it falls on your shoulders. In some cases, if your institution is small enough or even if your institution is big enough, sometimes it happens. And then we'll end with a couple of case studies. So you can see different approaches to recovery, as well as different types of disasters, because it isn't always a flood or a fire. It can come in many forms. So on that cheery note, where does the money come from? And the main four, as you probably know, are individuals, corporations, foundations, and government agencies. And with individuals, they're the ones we're going to be spending most of the time of. Yes, they may be dealing with their own recovery, but remember, we're beyond the post-immediate disaster now. We're, we're, we're a couple of months out or down the line, what have you. So why do you go to them? Because 75% of charitable giving is from individuals. They have no restrictions. Unlike corporations, foundations, and government agencies, there's no tax requirements. There's no grant caps. They can write give you know give as much as they want have it designated for what they want and determine how it's going to be paid out why did they give the motivation they believe in your mission and share your values they're interested in your programs and more importantly they want to make a difference in your organization and that is key at the time of disaster funding so you really want to make show them that even if they're giving a hundred dollars they're going to make a difference in your organization. And we'll get into that a little bit later on. But one of the things is, is that we as humans are hardwired to react to disaster. We want to make a bad situation better, even if we aren't in the thick of it. So we'll give when we wouldn't have otherwise. And I mean, and if you think about it, all of the various um, hurricanes, you know, Irma, Maria, Harvey, the tsunami, um, you know, the fires in California, all of that, people, you know, people living in other areas wouldn't, or Katrina even, you know, wouldn't have normally given to something like New Orleans, but because of Katrina, everybody did. Um, so it's, it's, yeah, like I said, you know, we, we can't get there, so we want to throw money at it. Um, and you might have even read, too, and this is something else, not to get political, but there have been a lot of rage donations where after the election, people felt as if they needed to do something to counter the organization. So they started throwing money at organizations they thought could counter. And so you'll see things like the ACLU got a huge number of donations from people that had never been on their radar or in their donor list or anything. And... Um, 
you know, but, but they wanted to do something. So like I said, throw money at it. Okay, so how do you find your individual donors? And your constituents are your most important. Do you have a wealth of prospects with whom you already have a relationship? They're using your services or resources. They're visiting you regularly. So look at your current donors. Who can you get interested in your recovery? And don't just look at the big ones. I am far more interested in the donor that gives me $250 a year than the one who comes to a benefit once and buys a $10,000 table. That $250 donor is loyal, she's engaged, and she could possibly give more, but she hasn't been asked. So don't assume that she can't give more. If you really start looking at, or your development department starts looking at your, your donor list, you might find some surprises. And I always use the example of one client of mine, um, you know, they were very much, oh, we need to find big money, big money. And I went back and started looking at their list. And in one case, I saw this one woman who was not giving a lot. I mean, her total giving was about $300, but I noticed she was starting to give and give more and was engaging more and all of that. So I did a little research and it turned out she's worth a billion dollars. But if, if you hadn't taken the time to do that, they would have just, they the client, they the client would have just said, oh, she's only given $300, she can't do more. So really, you know, look, um, another one I like to talk about are lapsed donors. You know, they already have a connection. They might have a, not, not have given to you for the last two, three, four years, you know, but now you have a neat, unique situation. So use it as a way to bring them back into the fold. Your volunteers, uh, you know, they use, they view financial contributions as an extension of their commitment. And then there's, of course, there's the board. And I can hear all the groans. I know it all too well. But in time of disaster, now it, that's more than ever is when you need them to be engaged in the process in order to succeed. So I always say fundraising is a team sport. It's a partnership between the staff and the board. It's not the responsibility of one or the other. So, you know, work with them. If they're nervous about soliciting gifts, figure out way, other ways to engage them in fundraising, whether it be they take a donor out to coffee, they introduce new people, they help cultivate, they help steward, they attend the major gift meeting, but they don't ask, they just sit there because the presence is needed, and all of that. So, you know, just think of other ways to engage them, but they need to be involved. And now I talk about um, sort of expanding the pool. You've, you've gone internally, now look externally. And I usually start with those who give to similar organizations. People concentrate their giving, so they will support more than one organization with a similar mission or relates to a particular interest. And the way to do it is through collaboration. Let's face it, you're gonna be in the same boat as all your fellow nonprofits in the area. So why not work together to engage donors? You have an unusable site, they have a usable one. Why not have a joint event? Is this stealing? No. Evidence shows that collaboration results in gains on both sides. Because again, it goes back to that if they're interested in what they're doing and your missions are aligned, they're going to be interested in what you're doing. And you know, I always use the Anglo-American because my European work there's a huge contingent of British American, UK American organizations. And you know, everyone is a member of every one of them. So it's, it's not stealing at all. Um, and similarly, you know, foundations like to see this. They can hit, you know, help two grantees with one grant, particularly of, of um, importance when you're dealing in a disaster situation. And similarly, corporations are getting more bang for their buck. And then I look, say, to look beyond the obvious. And those whose interests align with the work you do. So, you know, who funds the subject matter of the materials in your collections? Wouldn't they be interested in saving it? Who is interested in local history, geology, ge uh, sorry, genealogy, whatever? Um, so you're not looking at somebody who's interested in disaster recovery or conservation or libraries or archives or whatever per se. You're looking for someone who's interested in the broader context of that disaster recovery. Their interest is in what you're recovering. So use that to attract donors. Now you've found them and you know, you've, you've got your prospect list. So how do you do, what do you need to do to help bring them into the fold? 
Well, you need to know something about them first, and that's the prospect research. And really quickly, I always say, you know, look at things like where they have given, because it shows them what they what type of projects they're interested in. You know, how do they give to organizations? Are they endowing things? Are they giving annual gifts? Are do they like their name on things? Um, you know, what's their average gift size? That'll give you an idea of their capacity. You know, are they engaged in um, with the organization? Are they on the board or on a visiting committee? You know, where do they work and how is that business doing? You know, what is their work? You know, talk to board members, staff, volunteers who may know them, and talk to the prospect too. You know, talk, figure out what their philanthropic pri priorities are. And also, well, look at the various research tools. And some of these you probably know, annual reports, the gift lists, the donor walls, and few things. Um, Hoover's Online, Edgar's various other things give you insight into the businesses, where they work, and how those, those businesses are doing. Um, Zillow and Trulia, if you know where they live, you can get an idea of what their house is worth, and that could give you an idea of their net worth. Net worth sites, not all of them are celebrity driven. You can actually find information about business leaders and other people within that. And if you have Razor's Edge, if you're a big enough institution, Black Bout, who makes Razor's Edge, has a, a sub um, database called Research Point where you plug in your, your contacts and they can supply more financial information for you. Um, and donor search works similarly. Um, and you know, so once you've found them, you've done the, the um, research, then it's, it's the cultivation, the dance, as I call it. And I'm not going to discuss it here because there's so much out there on cultivation. But I will say that disasters do give you a new opportunity for this. You know, there's hard hat tours, there's participation in, in panels, there's museum re envisioning down halls all of that kind of stuff. So you can use that disaster as a way to engage your donors. Now, you've gone through all of this, now you've got to start asking them for money because you do have to ask them. And for smaller donations, appeals campaigns, targeted donations, the adopt -a campaigns, but what you have to watch out for is donor fatigue. And I'll give a case study about how one of my clients, we, um, we prevented that um, later on. Um, donor fatigue becomes an issue in times of disaster because remember, you're going to be raising money for a long time after it. One client um, has been doing it for seven years. You know, you have a lot of money. If your building's been destroyed, if, you're, if you have massive amounts of conservation work or collections post disaster salvage or anything to do, it's going to cost a lot of money, so it's not something you're going to, you know, you're not going to raise several million dollars in a year. You're going to have to do it in a while. So to prevent that donor fatigue, you know, be creative. People get bored with the same old promotions. Mix it up. Think of new ways to solicit funding from your donors. Be different from everybody else. Reframe so yours isn't the same appeal that they're getting it from everybody else impacted by your disaster. Use visuals. Show state of need. Don't be afraid to show less than ideal storage conditions. That'll give, um, you know, bolster your argument for the need for funding. You know, show your past accomplishments. Show the progress. And don't think on a large scale. 100 million books, documents, whatever. Your donor can't wrap his or her mind around that. Nor are they going to think their $100 donation is going to make a difference. So think smaller, one book, one document, one object. Suddenly that $100 donation can make a difference. Creating a team effort. Ask them to join the disaster recovery with their donation. Um, so they feel a part of the team restoring and, and you know, recovering the collections, the building, whatever. Um, and, you know, and naming opportunities, we all know about those. Um, now, I would be remiss if I didn't discuss crowdfunding. Um, and I'm not going to discuss all the platforms. Again, there's so much out there about them. But I wanted to give a few thoughts about, about how to go about doing one successfully, because you will be doing one. Everyone does. And just like when we all jumped on the social media bandwagon, you know, jumping into crowdfunding requires strategy and setting realistic goals. You can't set up a campaign and expect to reach 
you know, what you wanted to raise in three days in W Donor Base. It's not going to happen. Mainly because the crowdfunding campaign is about empowering your current supporters. And I'm talking here about your Facebook friends, your Twitter followers, those who do whatever it is you do on Snapchat, and Instagram people, all of that. They don't necessarily give you money, but they're still your stakeholders. They're the ones who are coming, you know, who are going to help you find the donors, and they will do so by your empowering them. And how do you do it? Make it easy. Make it easy for them to spread the word. Send them e-blasts, Facebook postings, you name it, that they can easily forward. And do it weekly during your campaign. Encourage them to forward that blast and ask that they encourage their friends to give. And remember, a gift results from every four emails that that stakeholder sends to a loved one, friend, acquaintance. So it actually does work in terms of getting donations. All right, now it seems like a lot, but if you plan accordingly, it won't be. Fundraising for crowdfunding campaigns, the success isn't made during the fundraiser. It's made during the weeks before the launch. And so plan for that promotion before that launch. Make sure you, all your e-blasts, your updates, your status thing, all the tweets, everything is ready to go. So all you have to do during the campaign is hit send. And you can even, going back to the planning, you can make this part of your, your disaster preparedness plan. Sort of, you know, how you're going to say, okay, well, we're doing X, Y, and Z. And, and then you'll just know and you'll go into autopilot. Now, if you're soliciting, and you will be soliciting big money gifts, because you are going to be raising millions of dollars, um, if you're going to that major gift donor, and however you, your institution defines a major gift, um, the best means of solicitation for these is face-to-face. -face. And have a game plan. Make sure everyone from your organization attending are on the same page regarding the project, the amount to ask for, the organizational mission. Then the key is make sure the right person is doing the ask, whether that's the board member, the executive director, you. Your relationship with the donor will tell you who that's going to be. And in terms of how much, don't sell yourself short. Ask for what your research shows the donor is capable of giving, and don't think asking for less will make the donor say yes. If you have a donor who's able to give a $50,000 gift, and you take them out for coffee or lunch or breakfast or dinner or whatever, and you ask for $5,000, their reaction isn't going to be, oh, okay, yeah, fine, that's easy. Their reaction's going to be, why are you wasting my time when I can give you so much more? And don't lowball a project. Um, you know, thinking that will help you get the funding. People know what things cost. They know a new roof is going to be five, you know, a million, five hundred thousand, a million dollars. So if you kind of say to them, "Oh, we're going to do it for you know fifty, they're they're they're, you know, not going to believe you, or you know, think you're just you're just trying to get something for um, the ask. Now, when you're going into the meeting, you know, obviously the you know ask in establishing rapport, discussing the project, and asking them to consider the gift. You do your ask. Then it's time to step back and let the donor talk. And, you know, listen for the issues of concern. Answer the questions. Don't prod or push. Um, and really, if you get a no, stay positive. But use that no response to keep the conversation going. You know, determine why. Maybe they can't do it right now. So say, okay, in six months from now, can we revisit this. Um, you know, maybe it's not enough or it's too much. Um, you know, maybe that's the project you're pitching they're not interested in. And if you're afraid to ask, rehearse it first. There's nothing wrong with that. And I think the thing most people have to realize is, is you don't really need to convince the donor. By the time you're having that donor meeting, you've done your cultivation, you've done your research. They know why they're at the meeting. They're engaged. They know the work you do. They just are waiting for you to do the final ask. And you, as I said before, you have to ask. And if you do get turned no, told no, just remember it's not personal. They're turning down the project, not you. Corporations. Um, and yes, again, everyone will be going to the same companies or they're in their own recovery. But that doesn't mean they don't want to put a good face on the community. So, you know, why do they give? Again, positive image in the community, and it's good business. Data has shown that a corporation that is active in the community 
Sorry, that was my dog snoring in the background. Not good. Um, anyway, it's 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 you know that giving to into the community actually um, increases their profit. So how do they give? Outright or matching cash, um, pro bono equipment or services. <laughs> yes, yes, he has snored on past programs. <laughs> um, pro bono equipment or services. You know, if you need a backhoe for a cleanup. Someone, a construction company might lend you one. Um, facilities use. Let's you know, say you, you know you need a place for a workshop or a board meeting. You need to borrow a conference room. In-kind gifts, computer equipment, office supplies, food for a benefit, and sponsorship, you know, which is something we all sort of know about. And of course, here too, you need to do the research as well. And you know, press releases, SEC filings, if they're a public company, are a good source of either where they may be giving and what kind of money they've been giving away, but also what their value is and how much they can give. Um, websites such as Edgar's Hoover's again, Yahoo Financial provided this kind of information. A, co a company foundation, um, usually they're on a company website under community. Um, and even if there's no foundation, they may have um, list programs and initiatives that they've made, pro post, um, made possible there. And then also look at the information in on the smaller companies. So your local chamber of commerce, your local CDCs can also provide, excuse me, information about um, corporations in the area. Helpful hints. Think beyond cash. Again, things like equipment, conference rooms, that kind of thing. And don't forget the little guy. And I mean, I know I'm talking to people from a major tech area, but um, look at you know, the, the, those big guys, the Goldmans, the Amexes, all of those, you know, if you're not a huge major institution, they aren't going to know you. Look at the little guy. He, the, the, the little store, whatever, down the street, they have much more to gain in terms of publicity and community goodwill and will probably be much more approachable. Now, again, you have to approach a corporation with a business mindset. This is how they will think. So use marketing techniques to pique their interest, show the profit they will make by quote unquote investing in the project, and figure out how you fit you and your project fits into their corporate strategy. You speak their language, markets, clients, return on investment, tangibles, you know, the impact your cause will have for them. And in the past, you know, corporations and conservation used to interface about the name on the wall for that, that exhibition. But when the market tanked, a lot of that changed. And the fact of the matter is, is we don't know what the other wants anymore. So take that leadership role because in, in that negotiation, because that's what it is. It's a negotiation. Ask what their goals are, express what yours are, and then find the areas of alignment and build from there. And someone once told me the best thing to do is start with what you can't offer. You can't offer a client dinner in a historic dining room or, you know, with collection materials around. Um, but once both parties, you know, once, once you understand what you can't do or they understand what you can't do and you understand what they can't do, then you can put all those aside and the options that can be put on the table can be negotiated and discussed. Now. That's enough on that. And we're going on now to foundations. And in time of disaster, many will step up. So contact those you have existing relationships with. See if they can provide emergency support. And I give you give the example of the Loose Foundation. Um, when the, After the market collapsed, they sort of cut out all new grantees and basically just provided general operating support to their usual grantees. Because when the market tanked, a lot of people's endowments tanked as well. So suddenly they weren't getting that endowment income. So they were able to help um, address the shortfalls. So how do you find them? Again, it's all about research. And I may sound like a broken record, but the fact of the matter is, is that fundraising is 85% research. It really, really is. And you know, they're the obvious sources. The foundation directory online, we all know it. It's a great resource. There is the foundation um, directory online 
free because the big one is a subscription. Um, it, this one allows you to search about the profiles of about 90,000 private foundations. It doesn't allow for subject searches, but at least you can get an idea of who's in your neighborhood. Um, foundation websites, obviously, more and more foundations are having them these days. Um, and if you're dealing with a lot of, there are a lot of smaller family foundations um, out there, they often don't have websites. And your Form 990, which is the foundation's IRS tax filing, um, same way you do your, your organization does one, they do them as well. And that can give you a really great idea of who they're giving to, how they're giving, um, how much they're giving, and all of that. And really look, particularly with the small family foundations, there's kind of three ways you can go. There are ones who basically support the same organization in and out. And there's one where you can look at their gift size and see that they're basically using their foundation to buy benefit tickets. So it's usually if you see a lot of 1,000, 2,000, 1,500, 750, 1,250, that kind of thing. That's what they're using the foundation for. And then there are others who are much more engaged in the impact investing that's currently become very, very popular. And that's a subject matter for a whole other webinar. But again, a lot of information about that out there um, on the Chronicle Philanthropy site, the nonprofit quarterly, it's a magazine, their site. A lot out there on that. Lastly, the government agencies all clearly stated in their guidelines. I'm sure all of you have gone for NEHs or IMLSs or NEAs before. Um, but I will say that make sure your online vendor, vendor registration, your SAM.gov and your grants.gov is all up to date because you can't even go to FEMA if they're not. So make sure. Um, and then also, too, don't just think of the federal. Um, you know, look at your state historic preservation office your Art, Archive, Library, Arts and Humanities Council, local county agencies, there's a lot of government money out there. Um, and similarly, too, going back to the idea of don't looking in the obvious, don't look for the, in the obvious for there as well. There might be, you know, Department of Education or Environmental, given if it's a, if it's a natural disaster and that kind of thing. There may be other avenues there that you can go to as well. Okay. You found your donor list, you've, you've done your cultivation, you've done your research and everything, you're good to go. But how are you going to communicate that disaster situation? Start with a story. Um, the most successful way of communicate, communicating information is through a story. People react more positively to a good story. It elicits an emotional response, and when folks are emotional, they tend to give. And it also gets you beyond the hard data. It helps people understand what is going on and the, um, and the issues regarding the collection or the building that's been hit by the disaster. You know, it, like I said, it goes back to that taking one book, one object, one document, and telling the story of that artifact, of how it went through the disaster, and what needs to happen to it afterwards. It's also a great way to make a case for need. Um, you know, while it seems obvious, our building fell apart. This isn't about financial need. It's about justifying the need for your recovery work. What's the problem? How are you going to solve it? And it kind of ties to demonstrating that impact. You know, articulate yours and the recovery's value to the community. Why is your recovery necessary and needed and good for the community? You know, it's not just about doing the good work in the museum. You need to show how you are an integral part of the community and your contribution to it, and that you're helping solve its problems, and that your recovery is necessary so you can continue doing your good work. It's positive changes beyond your walls. And that is what the need for collections care, in, in the eyes of many now, has really become. It's not about the object anymore. It's about um, make a picture, and I'll, I'll explain that a little bit as well. Um, and also, you need much more about evaluation. I mean, it used to be we reached our goals, and now, again, it's about the positive changes as a result of our work, the external results that matters. What changes in the knowledge, skills, behavior occurred in the people that you serve? And what evaluation methodology did you use to determine that? So I'm not gonna, again, not going to go into this, but the IMLS on their site, and you can see in the EM with 
web links linked to it. They have a little sort of um, online course, so to speak, called Shaping Outcomes. And it walks you through how to evaluate your audience, how to know what they're getting from your programs, how to quantify it, and how to qualify it, basically. So it's a really good resource to do, and I really recommend going through the little online course that's there. Now, how do you take all of this and put it into practice? So what I'm going to do now are three case studies. And these are not always your typical disasters, because not all disasters, as I said, are. Friends of Connectquat. The Friends of Connectquat is a nonprofit organization dedicated to the preservation, conservation, and history of the 3,400-acre Connectquat River State Park Preserve. And this is a state park on Long Island. And they work with the, the parks management to take care of, you know, the trails and hiking and the fishing and the various historic buildings on the, on the property. And they have they do public programs and all these great things. What makes the park so special and the reason why the friends are are working to to ensure it's it's preserved is the land was originally part of a royal patent given to William Nicol in the late 17th century. So it has colonial roots. Um, and then in the latter part of the 19th century, the 318 acres of the land was deeded to the South Side Sportsman Club of Long Island. And the reason why the boys, as I call them, did this is because Connecticut's actually one of the finest um, trout fishing uh, sites in the world, definitely in the country. And the members of this club were, you know, Gilded Age notables the Vanderbilts, the Roosevelt's, the Carnegie's, and they flocked to this land. A lot of them had uh, mansions and estates in the area. You often hear, anyone knows, about Long Island's Gold Coast on the North Shore. There was actually one on the South Shore as well, and there were Vanderbilt's and Belmont's and Roosevelt's, and they all had houses there as well. Um, and in addition to the clubhouse, and some of the other buildings on the site. And if you look at the left in that image, that's a colonial gristmill that the Friends have recently completed the restoration of. Um, but in addition to all of this, the preserve actually boasts the oldest hatch house in New York State and the country, which opened in 1884. This is the project I want to talk about. The hatchery, and I know I've got a fisheries person in there somewhere, so this is for you. Um, the hatchery had been continuously operating for over 120 years until January 2009 when the Department of Environmental Conservation denied the Parks Department renewal of the permit for the hatchery because there had been um, infectious pancreatic necrosis virus um, detected. And this is, IPN, is a pathogen detrimental to juvenile trout but not to humans. And this is what I always say, you learn a lot about different things when you, when you start doing fundraising. I now know more about infectious pancreatic necrosis virus than any non-fisher should. So seeing the urgency of the situation, the Friends chose to address the hatchery revitalization. And working with New York State and the Freshwater Institute, they have cleaned the facilities of the IPN and, you know, reconfigured the water sources of the hatchery to prevent a relapse. So now they're using well water instead of river water. So if there is another outbreak, it's contained. It's not going back into the river. Now that it's clean, quote unquote, there are, the friends are forging ahead with plans to improve the hatchery's environmental impact and its use as an educational re resource. That include restoring the historic hatch house and a construction of a new visitor center and educational exhibit. So this is a disaster of a different sort, but it's one whose impact reached far beyond the institution because the forced closure had a devastating impact not only on the environment but on the local community. Because the park was no longer producing fry and, and fish, the paid entry of fishermen was down by 90%, and the number of the visitors overall was down by 30%. So it, the denial of the permits caused cancellation of numerous events and curtailed the use of the preserve by educational outlets, such as local technical schools for student classes. 
and it also prevented the preserve from participating in the governor's initiative to expand fishing clinics. So the, but the biggest impact of all was the losses in fees for fishing, which was estimated at about $400,000 a year. Similarly, this, it was also a huge detriment to the economy and revenue of Suffolk County, where the park is, and New York State, because there was losses in sales tax revenue when local businesses, such as area hotels, restaurants, and sporting shops, saw a reduction in patronage due to the decreased angler visitorship in the preserve. And the park was no longer serving handicapped anglers. Um, and Kinequat, just so you know, is one of the few handicapped accessible fishing sites in the state. And lastly, the lack of fish also disrupted the normal cycle of the river and impacted wildlife, such as the migrating and nesting birds, the herons, the egrets, the osprey, who would, uh, had, would feed on the abundant fish in the river. Therefore, the fundraising for, this, for, for the hatchery revitalization wasn't focused on the hatchery as a, as a historic site, but on the economic impact to both the preserve and the community. And because of that, we were able to broaden the scope of the funders we approached. In addition to local government agencies, after all, this had community-wide impact, we were able to look at economic development funders and local business foundations and adding all of those to the existing pool of members and anglers groups. What was the story we told? We'll give you another picture to look at. Well, you know the usual. Cultural and historic tourism, you know, every dollar invested in tourism promotion generates a $51 return in the private sector. Cultural tourists spend more than other tourists. Cultural attractions bring in new dollars and retain local dollars. You know, job creation, how many full-time equivalents you add into the area with the hatchery. But then there were the more, um, you know, the, sorry, sorry. There were more direct economic in, in, in economic ben, uh, benefits. The nonprofit as a source of revenue is spending. So you had salaries, real estate purchase and rental. You had the professionals hires, contracting, marketing people, financing people, purchasing power. You know, the local businesses in the area need supplies. They were buying supplies. The local businesses in the area were either running out of business or closing, they weren't, people weren't buying the supplies anymore. And of course, tax revenues. And then there's the indirect, the, the dynamic recreational resource that attracts individuals and businesses to the community. You know, it improves quality of life. High skilled workers are attracted to communities where arts are available. Businesses are attracted to communities where there's high skilled workers. And you know, overall, when you have all of this, the economic development improves in results. So it all kind of works together. And so suddenly this emergency of IPN wasn't just about recovering the building and clearing out the virus. It was about improving the overall economic stability of the area. And that is how we presented it. And we were able to raise all the money to do this. And the Friends is actually serves as a role model for other state parks, Friends groups in New York. Um, in addition to the hatchery, they've also spearheaded, as I showed you before, the, the nickel grist mill um, preservation um, uh, effort. And you know, because of their, their successes, they've actually won awards. Um, and together, we've raised over a million dollars for these various projects and the educational programs and everything as well, which isn't bad for an organization whose annual operating budget is about $30,000 a year. So, with that, let's go look at a much more typical disaster, the Barnum Museum in Bridgeport, Connecticut. On June 24, 2010, an EF1 tornado formed over the city of Bridgeport and, without warning, hit right in front of the Barnum Museum. The damage was monumental, needless to say. The dome, which you see here, actually twisted and it completely undermined all of the structure below. The windows, so you see those lovely big plate, that's the whole building, you see those lovely plate glass windows in front, they completely shattered. One of them was by the air intake for the HVAC, and all of that debris went into the galleries, and you can kind of see some of it here. Um, 
So, and I, I wish I could, images really can't convey it. I wish I, I went into the galleries a few days after and everything sparkled because it was all covered with pulverized glass. It was a hole in the roof. Birds flew in. That's Barry. He came to visit us for a couple of days. And, you know, the collections also suffered as a result. There's a lot of mold, water damage, and all of that. In the true spirit of Barnum, the show must go on. And um, this writing on the, the boarding here was actually the brainchild of executive di director Kathy Marr, um, who despite all of the chaos that was going on around her within the institution, went to the Home Depot, got a can of spray paint, and put that on one of the boards. And she, she describes it now as sort of a testament to the need for a sense of humor and the sense of humor everybody had regarding the situation. Because the only way you can get through it all is if you can laugh at it. Now, during the, or at least you can keep your sense of humor. In the days after the storm, everyone went to triage regarding the, on the collections. There were thousands of them. They were all assessed. And basically, they all exhibited you know, typical damage that you would expect in this situation, mold, dirt. Then once the artifacts were secure, they really started looking into the extent of the damage of the building, you know, looking at the scope and getting it an idea of what it was cost. Now, once all of that was done, they could have said, well, we've had a donate tornado. We're going dark for the duration of the recovery. They didn't. They decided to see the tornado as a paradox, that this scary opportunity, this scary reality was a remarkable opportunity to move the museum into the 21st century and do something really innovative and really creative. So they began figuring out what the future of the museum was going to be as part of that disaster recovery. And that's what the story for fundraising became. Not the damage, but the future of this important institution within the community. So as a way to remain vital within the community and re-engage the membership, general audience, they opened on a limited basis in April 2012. They had a, a back adjacent undamaged space they were able to use. And they opened with a exhibit called Recovery in Action. And this enabled members, sponsors, and guests to view the activities of the museum during this unusual time and have a rare behind the scenes view of the complexities of disaster recovery at a major historic institution. There was a looping PowerPoint that showed the program and a video showing the damage in the, in the building because they couldn't bring anyone in. It had been um, not condemned, but basically it was unsafe. They were able to maintain their school and education programs for children and lifelong learners in this space and through outreach. And they continued to do projects with the collections. We were awarded an NEH grant to do a collection partnership project with the Bridgeport Library. It was about digitization of collections. And through all of this, we were able to show funders that we were still a viable cultural resource providing a service to the community. And we were able to keep our donors and audience engaged so they wouldn't forget us uh, or the work that lay ahead, which is much more important. It also allowed us to introduce new funders to the museum because we all had something to show them. And, you know, continue to make collections accessible via smaller exhibitions and online. And, but more importantly, it wasn't just disaster, as I said, it wasn't just disaster recovery a re-envisioning. So we were able to go to different funders that we wouldn't have been able to otherwise for that aspect of the project. So we were able to hire scholars to help with the development of new content. We were able to find the right exhibition designers to take all that scholarship and combine it with Barnum's showmanship to, and to put together a seamless, captivating experience. We could go to agencies like an NE, the NEH for a challenge grant, which are capacity building grants, because that's what we were doing. We were rebuilding our capacity. Or we could go to sustaining heritage collections at the NEH or the IMLS, because we were planning on implementing sustainable preservation strategies. Now, in recent years, the message has changed to re-envisioning the museum. And you can see how all of this is coming together. There's a link on the bottom for um, director Kathy Mars, she did a great TED talk on what the, the multimedia presentation they are planning and how it's going to really change how visitors engage with the collections, the stories, and the, and the themes. 
So it, it, that, it's, it's really spectacular. I highly recommend you going to. But when stepping back, what we realized in the re-envisioning and what we've all learned is that it's really that the commu critical that the community be at the center of your disaster recovery. You, you need them to be at the table if you want them to support it, financial or otherwise. So what we, museum began doing was having you know community in for workshops and meetings to get their input and behind the recovery and going through all of these town halls and everything what they really learned was that no one really cared about the tornado the recovery eff effort shifted to what the museum could do for that audience you know whoever that audience was at that moment so the learning takeaway from this was that if the, com the community doesn't think you're relevant, you're not. And that's what le legislators want to know as well. So when you're looking for that government money, you have to be relevant. How are you creating jobs? How are you part of economic impact? How are you serving the community? All those questions come back over and over and over again. And you know, and the reality is, is, is in many ways, this is where a lot of funders are going. Um, it's not about that institution anymore. It's about that broader impact. I can't say it more than enough. And I often give the states the, the example as the New York State's Historic Preservation Grants, Bricks and Mortars Grants, one of the few we have here. And the application, 62 questions, two of them are about site significance. The rest of them are about job creation and what are you doing back to the, giving back to the community and fulfillment of state, you know, various state economic uh, development plans and that kind of thing. Our last case statement is the American South. Again, this is going back to uh, preventing donor fatigue. And the Merchant's House is truly a unique institution in New York. Um, it was built in 1832 and purchased by the Treadwells in 1835. And the family remained in the house until 1933 when the youngest daughter died. It was about then that a cousin who was given it, inherited it, decided to convert it into a house museum, and it opened in 1936. It is significant as a rare survivor from the early 19th century in New York City. It has a nearly intact collection of the original owner's possessions displayed in a largely unaltered Greek revival interior. So you're, it's interpreted with the family's possessions in the interior that is basically as it was as the family lived in it. It has the uh, finest extant example of historic plaster work in the country. And it's because of this that it's not only a state and city landmark, it's also a national historic landmark. And it's one of the few buildings that's actually been landmarked for its exterior and an interior. So what's its disaster? In April 2012, Plans were announced for a hotel in the lot adjacent to the museum. And I'm going to point here, it's this, it's this property right there. And this caused much concern in the community. Again, it goes back to the community. The design was deemed uncon uncontextual for the NoHo neighborhood, the Historho north of Houston. It's a historic district. But more importantly, it was going, the construction was going to pose, pose a serious threat to the structural stability of the merchant's house, its interior elements, and its collections. And even though the, the, the developer you know, says that it was making you know, take pre protection provisions, they were completely inadequate. And you know, these provisions are really mandatory because you know, enough vibration or ship building shift, even an eighth of an inch, was going to damage that historic plaster. So in the two years, the hotel became a catalyst for community action. Uh, the house, government officials, preservation organizations, local residents, all rallied to protect the house and the neighborhood's sense of place as well. There were petitions, things were presented to the community board, um, who, is, who has continuously voted against the hotel and, and the rezoning of it, because we also have to rezone for that hotel. Um, but you know, despite all of this, despite the design height, despite um, you know the materials being wrong, our Landmarks Preservation Commission approved it in 2014. And I don't know how if you're aware about how our our 
Landmarks Preservation Commission, the LPC, works, because it's landmarked and in a historic district, any work or any construction needs to be approved by the commission. And then it goes to the community board and the borough presidents and city council and all of that. Um, and despite that, the developer said, we we're going to take all these precautions to protect the house. The really reality is, is that nothing was in writing. So while the lawyers have been negotiating, the house is, the museum has been really proactive and conducting assessments to predict poss possible damage and develop protection plans for the structure of the collection. In the last three years, and here's, here's some of our materials, the last, the, lots of ch has changed in the last three years. But what has remained consistent is the museum's effort to keep the disaster in the forefront of the audience mind and thus the focus of their philanthropy. Um, first, the collection, the buildings and collections fragility served as a springboard for educational programming aimed at correcting the misconception a landmark is guaranteed survival and that there are many diverse issues that it's not immune from. Landmark, handled with care, was the educational program that included lectures and workshops featuring noted experts that addressed topics such as the care and conservation of the historic plasterwork to the bricks and mortars work that constantly takes place to ensure the house's structural stability. In all of these programs, efforts to protect the house from the impending construction next door was emphasized. And this not only educated donors, both current and future, because we did attract donors this way, it kept them engaged in it. And then other ways we, the construction was used to engage donors is, oh, sorry, there's a lovely shot of the house there. Um, we were, they were called on to sign petitions, write letters, give testimony, or even just be in a room for a community board meeting or what have you to demonstrate that the house wanted, that the community wanted the house to be protected. And these activities continued as well to keep donors informed of the situation and made them active participants in saving the house. All of our appeals uh, at the time of the hearings and after even up till now gave members and, and current donors updates on the construction and asked that they support the cause. New institutional funders were solicited for technical assistance grants for the architectural and collection protection plans, the engineering analysis and, and communications um, strategies. Um, because you need publicity when you're when you're plan to do all, you know, you need a publicity plan when you're doing all of this and legal fees. We also applied to new institu institutional funders for the educational programs that focused around the emergency, like the National Trust, like local preservation, like our humanities councils. And, and now these funders have continued on and, and supporting sort of non-emergency related programming. During tours, donors were asked for donations or audiences were asked for donations. And there are signs throughout the house on the threat. There was also an online campaign. I'm going to end here with a pretty picture of the garden um, because you have to do crowdfunding, as I said. And we've also introduced a lot of new groups to the house through those collaborative events. Again, it shows how collaboration works. We have, we have seen their members, seeing how special the house is, become members themselves, attendees in programs, and donors. Um, and at the last one, we walked people came in, they already knew about the construction and they were asking about it. So the message is getting out there even though we're, you know, eight years beyond from when it first hit the news. And despite the fight, the museums continued to implement its historic restoration and furnishings plan and it always remained open during the work so visitors could see what was involved in preserving a historic site and just what the construction would destroy. That message that the museum would continue despite the threat was told through other fundraising campaigns that were designed to just fund the care of specific objects or new initiatives like we reupholstered all that lovely um, furniture you saw in the front parlor suite. You know, benefits and annual galas, they kept going. And again, they served as a way to remind donors of the uniqueness of the house and the threat that was very still very much alive. In other words, the museum continues to offer its programming, yet the visitor is consistently reminded, albeit sometimes quietly, that this, there is still that specter of the construction next door. But by using different avenues to keep the members abreast of the situation, the museum has prevented donor fatigue on the, you know, oh, that construction project, I've already given to that. We don't have that issue. 
we are what we are short of is that the donors are still engaged in the in the emergency and are still willing to give to the cause. And actually, the the last gala and a couple of recent events um, have focused on new developments that have ha been happening. I'm not allowed to talk about them yet, but it's 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 constantly evolving and changing. And because it's constantly evolving and changing, we're able to constantly evolve and change our fundraising materials. And um, again, it keeps people in the loop and engaged. And you know, they're not they're not hearing that. Oh my God, we're having this construction next door. They see things are happening. And with that, I'm going to end and turn it back over to Jess. Well, thank you so much, Susan. Uh, such a, a wonderful overview of this very important topic. And I think you made the excellent point at the beginning that you know, even if this isn't necessarily in your job description, um, you all, as stewards of your collections, uh, need to be aware of the role that you can play in helping to raise funds to uh, get your institution back on its feet after a major event. So I just want to remind you all um, to go ahead and feel free to drop any questions you might have in that chat window that you use to say hello. Um, so feel free to go ahead and chime in if there's anything that you have to ask of Susan. And Susan, I believe, do you have your final slide here with your uh, website? Oh, my copy. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, so um, <laughs> Susan provided her website here. If you want to go find some more information, um, mm -hmm. this is a really excellent resource as well. So um, I'll go ahead and if anyone's percolating, thinking of some questions, I'll go ahead and pull over. Um, this is a link to a survey tool. So if you all could just take, it takes probably about two minutes of your time to just fill this out. Um, it's very helpful for us in figuring out um, how we can make these programs as um, helpful and effective as possible. So this works the same way as the links at the bottom of your screen. So just click on Evaluate the Webinar and click that Browse To button, and hopefully that should take you directly to a survey tool. Um, so let's see, one question possibly coming in here. Um, and a, again, a reminder, if you didn't get the chance to go ahead and open those links at the bottom of the screen, please do go ahead and do that. Um, they will be captured on the recording webpage as well, so you can always refer back to them. But these are two really excellent resources, so I would encourage you to check them out. And um, okay, so here's a question for us. <laughs> Can you speak to how fundraising may be managed within our cultural institutions? i.e. who is primarily responsible for it. Most of us will be focused on the hands-on recovery of our collections, so we would be providing support to whomever is doing the actual fundraising. Well, that depends on your... Okay, so you're, Corey, you're at the fry. Um, the first question is, 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 do you have a development department or somebody on the staff there for who is primarily responsible for it. Depending on the size of your institution, um, and I know the Fry, I'm pretty sure you have a development department there, it's usually um, the development department that is primarily responsible for developing a plan for seeking support after a disaster. Um, they are working in concert with your director as well as your board member, and assuming the size of your board, if there's a uh, development or fundraising committee on your board, sort of working there. But it's 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 sort of taking the step back in terms of assessing the need, and then and then figuring out from there who is who's going you know developing that disaster plan, disaster fundraising plan. Um, after you've kind of gotten through that those initial fundings, your FEMA and insurance and all of that. Sort of who will be going for there. So it, it kind of varies from institution to institution and depending on size. But if you have a development department, it would be their responsibility, um, sort of preparing the, the the materials. What also happens too is you, as the archivist, conservator, curator, registrar, whatever, will be called upon to help give that development department or whomever is doing the fundraising at your institution, providing them with the information they need. So a lot of times, 
and I've, I've been subjected to this as well, you have the development officer developing the programs, and that's really not the way it should be. It should be, whether it be the education department or the conservation, they should be the one developing what the project is going to be, and then the development person basically putting it into fundraising speak, as I like to call it, or figuring out the gaps, like you know, the community impact, the, the, the impact, the evaluation, and all of that sort of materials. Um, you know, the conservation team or whatever um, will pull together the, you know, the project budget and how much things are going to cost and all of that. So it, it's sort of primary responsibility is, is uh, the managing the project managing of a request is development, but everybody else is feeding into it. I hope that answers your question in a long roundabout way. Well, thank you, Susan. I think that really thank helps you. to clarify. Sure what those relationships look like and um, the roles that the folks who are participating in this training should be expected to play uh, when it comes to a call. Right. Right. Again, as I said, it's, it's fundraising is a team sport. And mm -hmm. so it are right. So this, this group learned about the incident yes. system. Um, yeah. And Corey's pointing out that, yeah, within that, uh, okay. there should be a position specifically for fundraising. And I think certainly within the immediate response phases, it would make sense for to be functioning within yeah. the ICF. Yeah, I mean, it, exactly. I mean, it goes back to my earlier point of when you're doing your disaster preparedness plans, um, you're or, you know, disaster recovery, whatever, you should include some information about fundraising, even if it is sort of figuring out, okay, well, who's taking the lead on this aspect of it? And, you know, what avenues do we think we're going to to go to, you know, first? And basically, you may want to lay it out with, okay, development's going to, you know, pull together the information needed for FEMA, and, you know, your finance office may be dealing with the insurance issues, and all of that. So that's, you know, it, it's a it's a good section to have. To sort of, this way people can just know who needs to, who needs to do what, when, and how. Well, I don't see any other questions coming in at this point. But um, I hope you all have been given some nice food for thought here. And, um, and I'm I'm going to type in my email. If anybody else thinks of anything, feel free to drop me a line. Um, perfectly happy to Thank answer you. questions after this. Um, I appreciate that. And uh, just a reminder again, please do mm -hmm. feel, feel free to go ahead and fill out that uh, survey link. It'll be very helpful for us. And I want to give a, a big thank you to Susan for this fantastic presentation today. And um, thank you to everyone who was able to join us live. Uh, hope you found this webinar platform to be easy to use, and I'm looking forward to continuing the series with you all uh, throughout these summer months. So thanks again, everyone. And um, to the folks on the West Coast, um, I guess you're coming up on, well, I guess you're a little afternoon now, so enjoy your afternoon. <laughs> all right, have a good one, everyone. Thank you.